Uh, I want to show you some things about this Tides Lab and the links to the websites that are mentioned in the lab, Tides and Currents, uh, and then uh, time and date is listed here. And then there's a the thing about moon phases. And you'll have time to work on the Tides Lab, and I can answer other questions that you might have, like at the end. So anyway, on the right-hand side, on your upcoming, if you have questions about the waves and tsunami, um, problems, then I can answer those at the end of class today too, but the waves and tsunami uh, paper, you want to get that done today. That's just like, you know, including information in there about things that you've learned about waves and about tsunami. And then this Tides Lab is a lab, it's due Friday. That gives you plenty of time. In fact, you might even be able to get it done uh, today at the end of class, or at least get a good start on it. And you'll have time to work on it tomorrow too. So in the waves, tides, and coasts, or if you click on Tides Lab, that'll bring up um, a OneDrive document. It says Tides Lab. It just says Tides Lab Final because I finalized it after working on it for a bunch of different ways. Whenever we did this lab in person, it was a little bit different. So I had to uh, make it work a little bit differently that it's online. So the there are a lot of different websites that can show you about tides and tide predictions. And the major one, let's see. It looks like the video is like not so great. I don't know. Hopefully the video looks all right. I mean, like the live feed. Um, the one of the best uh, sites that describes about tides and tidal height is tidesandcurrent.noaa.gov. So uh, you can you can copy and paste this link, you know, into a new tab. Oh come on into like a new browser tab. Well, whatever, I'll just add a tab. So um, I've mentioned this before, I believe, but there's a federal government agency called NOAA, N-O-A-A. And NOAA stands for the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And it's the branch of the federal government that takes care of all measurements related to the ocean and the atmosphere. So the National Weather Service is actually part of NOAA. Um, nearly all satellite data that's collected for uh, weather forecasting is publicly available uh, data made available by NOAA, and then private companies take care of weather forecasting. Um, there's also forecasting is done by private companies for uh, tides and tide forecasts and things. So anyway, when you go to tidesandcurrents.noaa.gov, this site uh, gives you a splash page that has a bunch of information at the bottom about, you know, things about, well, this has a thing about tsunami warning systems and different things about algae blooms and high tide bulletins and stuff. But the easiest way to navigate it is the site shows a map of the United States and it shows some states here that are like tan in color. So these are inland states or uh, waterlocked states. Um, these states do not touch the ocean or touch the Great Lakes. The states up here these are all Great Lakes states. Well, New York is also a, um, you know, an ocean state because it touches the ocean. But Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, Illinois, and Indiana, these states you don't want to use because these states, this information is about water levels in the Great Lakes because these are states here that touch the Great Lakes. Also, if you were to touch any of the Great Lakes, like, uh, well, this is Superior, Michigan, Huron, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, those Great Lakes, uh, there's water level information for those lakes and for uh, those states. And that's because uh, the water level in the Great Lakes varies depending upon uh, rainfall amounts, snowfall amounts, and then there are actually uh, dams and uh, canals that we can regulate the flow of water, especially in the lower lakes, um, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. It turns out, interestingly, Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are actually one body of water. They, uh, the water um, is continuous between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, but because there's this very narrow, uh, this very narrow um, channel that exists between them, between the Upper Peninsula and Lower Peninsula of Michigan, they're, and they're named as separate lakes. Anyway, for this experiment, or for this lab, what you care about are the tide levels in the oceans. So the Pacific Ocean states, uh, Washington, Oregon, and California, but then also Alaska and Hawaii, you could use Alaska and Hawaii, 
but for the continental United States, uh, California, Oregon, and Washington are useful. And then on the East Coast, there's a whole bunch of states all the way along the East Coast, down to and including Florida, and then around in the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico is also continuous with the um, Atlantic Ocean. So anyway, you can click on any state that you want. And so let's just, whatever, click South Carolina. When you click on South Carolina, it'll show you um, a map of the East Coast. And it doesn't take you exactly to South Carolina, but kind of zooms in a little bit. And then you'll see there are these numbered circles. And those refer to individual locations where tide levels are both measured, but also predicted. So if we're going to pick somewhere down here in South Carolina, oop, well, here we go. So here, like near uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, there are some places. And what's important on this map and for this lab is that you pick locations where water levels measured. And so you can either use the circles that have red and yellow or just red. The yellow refer to meteorological stations. And those are places where like rainfall rates, uh, wind speeds, things like that are measured. Uh, water level is measured um, with the ones that have a red dot. So up here, this one is just a location where water level is measured and predicted. This one is a place where both water levels measure and predicted, but it's also a meteorological station. And there's another one down here. And it turns out there are even more floats than that that exist along the coast, but these are particular locations. So I'm gonna go in and pick this one. It doesn't really matter. It says Charleston, uh, Cooper's River Inlet. And when you click on that, that dot, this is interesting, it actually says high water alert, station may be experiencing flooding. This shows today's low tide, high tide, and then another low tide, another high tide. So within a 24 hour period, there are two high tides, two low tides. The numbers tell you the tidal height relative to sea level. So average sea level is exactly zero feet. Uh, so when it says negative 0.93 feet, that means that the water level will be below sea level, which might not seem like it makes any sense, except as the tides come up and down, the uh, water level is sometimes above mean sea level and, above and below uh, mean sea level. So this, this high tide here, six, uh, six feet above sea level might be a fairly high tide for that location. Anyway, so in the lab, um, I wrote, work only with locations on the Atlantic or Pacific. Don't border the states that uh, touch the Great Lakes. And then uh, click on, or pick a location. It doesn't matter where, anywhere along the East Coast. You wanna do somewhere up in Maine, that's fine. You wanna be down in Texas, down in Florida, anywhere along the East Coast. So in the Atlantic Ocean, pick somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. And once you pick the location in the Atlantic Ocean, it'll bring up a map like this, or a little box like this, like says Ocean City Inlet. Just like here, I picked this one, says Charleston Cooper River Entrance. Um, then I wrote here, when you click on the location, the dialog box will appear with some information for today. Click on Tide Predictions under More Data. So I've got a little illustration here that shows what you want to click. So under More Data, you click Tide Predictions. And this, uh, on this website that I just went to, this would be for today, right now, under more data, you click on tide predictions. So what this shows is the predicted high and low tides for that location. It has the, the location that we picked. And then uh, on this graph, the green line is the current time. That's right now. So it's uh, like the current time, you know, it's like one o'clock uh, p.m. This is, uh, let's see, yeah, it's in, let's see, LST, huh, okay, I don't know when it's updated. Anyway, so the green line is like current time, approximate current time, and these dots here show you high tide and low tide heights and times. So this is the next low tide at uh, 2.32 p.m. I guess the 12 o'clock must be, oh, I get, I get it. This is the 12 o'clock p.m. And this is this is the current time, which is like one o'clock p.m. Because right here it shows, this is at like 2.30. So right around 2.32 p.m., there's gonna be a low tide at, six, at 0.64 feet below sea level. So that's like about seven inches below sea level. 
but then uh, this evening at 8.23, it's going to be five feet above sea level. So the difference in tide height in that location is about six feet. I mean, that's the height of a, the height of a, you know, a, a person. The, the ocean height will change by about six feet just in that time from 2.30 to around 8.30. So within a six hour period, um, the water level is going to go up six feet. And then in the next six hours, it goes back down six feet. And then it looks like it goes up even further because we're at negative 0.78 going to up to 6.58 feet. So that's about um, six and a quarter or seven and a quarter, almost seven and a half feet of difference in water height between uh, 234 this morning and 905 this morning. Anyway, uh, this chart here, you wanna copy and paste that into your document. So I'll show you what I mean. Uh, here you can write your East Coast location. So what location did you pick and what state is it? And normally you just kind of like hand draw the graph from the thing, but uh, I want you to put a screenshot of the graph right in there. So you may have already figured out how to make a screenshot on uh, your Chromebook, but I found instructions because I don't happen to have a Chromebook. It looks like if you want to take a screenshot of a portion of the screen, which is all you want, you hold shift and control uh, so the shift buttons here, control buttons there, you hold those buttons and then you click this button up here that says show window. You should have those but you should have the show window button on your Chromebook. If you don't, um, you can find out how to take a screenshot of that page. So what I mean by that is on my computer, it's different, but I can select the area that I want to um, take a screenshot of. And once I've selected that area, then I can just delete this thing, which was the, the instructions for it, and then paste in there the image. If you have trouble doing that, you can also like take a picture of it with your phone and email it to yourself and insert it. Um, if you really can't get it figured out, it's not the end of the world. But the, the purpose of pointing the graph in there is that as we continue studying uh, tides and stuff at uh, the ocean, you might refer back to this document and then you can see how these pieces of information that you recorded relate to the graph. So anyway, if you can get the graph put in here, that's, that's good. There's some things that I want you to uh, record and then just do a little really basic math about. The highest value for the high tide in the next few days, lowest value for the low tide in the next few days. So what I mean there is like, it looks like the lowest tide here is about negative 0.78 feet and the highest high tide 6.58 feet. So if you put in like negative 0.78 and 6.5 whatever, the tidal range is what we call the difference in the height of the tide. So it's the difference in these two heights. And it turns out because one of them is negative, it's actually the greatest height minus the negative value. So it's really the absolute difference in the water level. That's the tidal range. And this location that I happen to pick happens to have a pretty big uh, tidal difference of like six feet. There are other places along the coast where you might find it's only like one foot. Um, the one I showed you yesterday in that little video, the Bay of Fundy, it's 30 feet, which is extraordinary. So different locations will have different differences in uh, tidal height. And then the date and time for the next high tide, and date and time for the second high tide. So what I mean by that is, if this is the current time, the next high tide happens here at 8.23 p.m. Uh, and then the next one after that is at 9.05 a.m. So it's about you know 8.30 tonight and about nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Now that's not exactly 12 hours, but that's pretty close to a 12 hour difference. How many hours and minutes is there between the next two high tides. So what's the difference in time from uh, this high tide to that high tide right there? Okay, then do somewhere for the west coast. So you've got information about somewhere on the east coast and you know the times. Um, you can go back and click on tides and currents again, pick somewhere on the west coast. So I don't know what, there it goes. So here's a West Coast location. Here's somewhere along uh, 
along the uh, Oregon coast. So like South Beach, Oregon, I've been there. Uh, you click on tide prediction. And then here's our difference in tidal height. Now, there's a something different looks, at, there's something that looks different about this graph. In the graph before, it looked nice and regular, meaning that the heights of the high tides and the heights of the low tides were nearly the same. In this graph, it doesn't look like that at all. Instead, there's this high tide and there's a really low, low tide. And there's another high tide, but it's not as high as the one before. And this low tide isn't nearly as low as the one that existed before that. So in some areas, the high tides and low tides are very regular and uniform in how high they are and how low they are. In other places, it's not as regular as you'd expect. So in other words, like there's a high tide of 10.7 feet or 10.4 feet, but the one before that was only 8.17 feet. Similarly, there's a low tide that's about two feet below sea level, but the next low tide is actually four feet above sea level. So these low points here vary in how low the water level actually is. And that's something common about the difference between the East Coast and the West Coast. East Coast tides are very regular in the sense that the heights of the high tides are about the same and the heights of the low tides are about the same. But on the West Coast, it's a totally different story. But the same plan, um, get a screenshot of the graph, you can put it in there. So what's the highest value for the high tide in the next few days? Here for this one, you know, 10.37 feet. The value for the low value for the lowest tide is, let's see, negative 1.91 feet. So it's not necessarily the next tide, but this is about a two day period, the highest high tide and the lowest low tide. And that difference from here to here, uh, that's the tidal range. And in this place, it turns out that tidal range is even bigger than it was on the East Coast, because this is 10.37 feet, and this is negative 1.91 feet. So that's about, you know, about 12 feet difference in height of the tide. And 12 feet, you know, is the height of like two people. It's about the height of a one story house. So that's a pretty significant difference in height, in the height of the tide. Uh, there are some, what do you call it, uh, harbors here on the East Coast. And that plays a really big role in whether or not a ship can get into a harbor. So this is uh, Newport, Oregon. And actually there's a really, there's a really awesome aquarium here in Newport um, called the Oregon Coast Aquarium. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. And it goes into this Yakina Bay. And so the deal is there, there is a harbor right here. And uh, let's see, this doesn't have the satellite view. No, you can see the outline of a harbor here. And this does, doesn't, this map program doesn't have a satellite view, but there are slips for ships and small uh, pleasure craft and uh, sailboats that will go into this marina. And then it turns out that this harbor here, um, the, the marina has a deep draft, meaning that the water is fairly deep here, but the inlet to the harbor is relatively shallow. When the tide comes in, the water rushes in at a pretty fast rate. Um, so you get like pushed into the harbor and when the tide is going out, the water comes out fairly quickly. But because the water is relatively shallow here, if you try to leave this marina and go out to the ocean, whenever it's a uh, low tide, you can end up running aground. So there are only certain windows of time that the boat can get in and out. And that difference in water height is 12 feet from uh, high to low. So anyway, you have an East Coast location and a West Coast location. Um, for the West Coast location, I want you to look ahead for some period of time. So that you're still in the West Coast location, um, down at the bottom, there's a thing that has options for the amount of time. So this is actually showing you just two, like two days worth of time. I want you to look ahead um, about a month. And it doesn't have to be exactly a month, but this is December 15th to December 16th. Um, so about a month from now, you can't go more than 31 days. It doesn't allow that. So maybe we'll just go December 15th to like, I'll just go January 13th. That's good enough but you got to make sure you change the year because 
you know, a month from now is going to be next year, it'll be 2021. And once you change the date, then instead of this graph showing from December 15th to December uh, 16th into the 17th, it'll be from December 15th to January about 13th. And uh, like in the lab here, you change that date to about a month from now, and then you click here where it says plot daily. So if you click plot daily, then it changes the graph to show you what the, what the tide looks like over the course of the next month. And there's interesting patterns that you see. It looks like right around now, the height from the high tide to the low tide is really extreme. The highest high tide is about 10.3 feet above sea level, and the lowest low tide is about two feet below sea level. When you go ahead a few days, uh, December 22nd, December 23rd, that high tide and low tide, there's not much of a difference in height at all. So the difference in tide heights is fairly small. This is a high tide and that's a low tide. And then when you go ahead a little bit further, you get another extremely high tide and an extremely low tide. So the great tide heights in the video yesterday we saw should be related to uh, when there's a full full moon. So if we have a full moon in here, or a full moon in here, that would correlate to um, the astronomical observation. And then when you're like in here, that's when you have like a, uh, well, this is either a full moon or a new moon. And this is either a full moon or new moon. And this is like a quartering moon, like right in here. So um, which day in the next month has the highest high tide? In other words, when during this month is the high tide the highest? And it actually looks like it's actually today, December 15th. That's 10.37 feet. Because in here it's something like 9.27. And out here it's like 10.14. So actually like today, 10.37 feet. That looks like a pretty high, high tide. And when is the lowest low tide? So the lowest low tide is when the low tide is as far down as possible. And that also turns out to be today like negative 1.91 feet. Sometimes the highest high tide and the lowest low tide are not necessarily on the same day. But over here, this is not 1.91 feet only 1.45. So just coincidentally, it happens to be like right around today at that location. So uh, you find out what day is the highest high tide, what day is the lowest low tide. And then what do we want to do is find a lunar calendar. So what a lunar calendar is, is just a calendar that shows uh, lunar phases. And I put a link to a lunar phase calendar thing in the plan for the week. But you don't have to use that one in particular. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, right here, there's a lunar phase calendar at timeanddate.com slash moon slash phases. But you can also just go to Google and type like lunar calendar. And there's a whole bunch of sites that'll show you lunar calendars. Um, it really doesn't matter. But here like at almanac.com, which, which should show the same kind of thing, even though it's Farmer's Almanac. Um, here is a, uh, let's see, December 2020. Yeah, so there's a full moon on the 29th. There was a new moon on the 14th. So it turns out that um, it's not surprising that the highest high tide is today because that's correlated with there being a new moon. When you look ahead to the 29th, uh, the 29th, there's a full moon. Hold on. When you go to the 29th, that's like uh, right in here. So see, like it says December 29th, that's also a time when the tide is very large. So it seems like whenever there's a, a high tide, uh, a very high high tide and very low low tide that is related to whether it's a full moon or a new moon 
anyway, so you've got your you've got your own locations. You can pick anywhere on the West Coast and anywhere on the East Coast, and uh, put that in. Now, and I wrote another thing in here about um, two different types of tides. There are tides called diurnal tides, and these diurnal tides are very regular, follow a nearly perfect sinusoidal function. Like the one we looked on the East Coast was really regular like this, a nice up and down and up and down and up and down. That's uh, that's very typical of what's called a diurnal tide. And then a mixed tide, those are tides that are like kind of wonky like this, up and down and up and down. The high tides and the low tides are not similar in height as time goes on over the course of a day or over the course of a month. So which one of your two locations looked more like a diurnal tide like this? And which one of your two locations looks more like a mixed tide like that? Now, depending on the place you pick, there are places on the East Coast that have kind of irregular tides. And there are places on the West Coast where the tides are a little bit more regular than the ones that I just randomly picked and showed you. But um, one of the tides will look more regular in that the heights of the high tides are very similar and the heights of the low tides are very similar. And similarly with uh, diurnal tides, one of them will be a little crazier looking. And also, which of your two locations has a greater tidal range? So it was pretty clear to me here that um, this one we picked on the West Coast has a much bigger difference in tide height, 10 feet down to negative 2 feet. That's a 12-foot difference. But then uh, that one we, I randomly picked on the East Coast was only like 4 or 5 feet. So uh, pick two locations, um, East Coast and West Coast, and, and figure out how that goes. So this site is actually pretty good. Um, tides and currents, it shows both tidal activity and current activity for all kinds of places. Maybe we want to go here to New Jersey, so pretty close to us, actually down near Philadelphia and Marcus Hook. Uh, Marcus Hook is right by the airport in Philadelphia. There's a whole bunch of, uh, uh, like the Philadelphia shipyard is there for the Navy, and then um, a bunch of oil tankers come in and out and service the uh, lower Delaware River. So if you care about how that looks, just outside of Philly, which is really the nearest place to us, you'll see that the tide height is from six feet to about negative 0.35 feet. So about a seven foot tide height difference right now. But then if we go for about a month, uh, let's see, January 14th, 2021, then plot daily, this will show the month graph. And you see it's not, quite as much of a difference. So there in Philadelphia, the, the tides are far more consistent from day to day and over the course of a month than the last one we just looked at. So this tool is used by, um, by all sorts of people. Um, it turns out that, like I showed you that article and I've talked about this a couple different times about um, collecting fish out here in uh, Shinnecock Bay. And it turns out the best time to collect those fish, like in the last uh, unit, is whenever there's low tide. Because whenever the, low, whenever the tide goes down, the water depth is a whole lot less. Well, the nearest place to there, there where there's a tide location is here in Montauk. So let's say I'm gonna be like, well, I'd like to go collect fish sometime in the next, you know, the next couple weeks which I don't because it's too cold and uh, all the fish are dead now. But if I were to want to, here's like a tide calendar which shows the tide heights. And I wanna be in the water at a convenient time of day when there's a low tide. So here's a low tide, but that's 3.44 a.m. I'm not, I don't wanna be in the ocean then, that's done. 4.39 p.m., well that looks a little bit better. So 4.39 p.m. is actually a low tide. So if I wanna collect fish whenever the tide is low, uh, you know, maybe starting like 3.30, going to 5.30, that gives you a two-hour window when the tide is relatively low. Where instead, if you were to collect when the water, when it's like 9 in the morning or 10 at night, that's pretty late at night. This is a three-foot tide that's negative 0.5 feet. So that's a difference of three and a half feet. And that's like well over my waist. So you get rid of like a waist worth of height of water just by picking the time uh, fishermen commonly use this tidal chart to help them understand, you know, when fish might be coming in, when fish might be going out. It helps you understand whenever the water rushes in and rushes out of the bay. 
because in those bays, uh, when it's high tide, the water will run into the bay. And when it's going to low tide, the water runs out of the bay. And at the inlets in the bays, as it goes from high tide to low tide, you can predict what the direction of the current of the water will be. So whenever it's coming into a high tide, the water's running in. When you're going into a low tide, the water's going out. So the water is constantly being flushed in and out of the bay. And that also helps to like rejuvenate the bay in the sense that any kind of wastewater that ends up in the bay gets uh, refreshed. Same thing with these other bays and inlets. Uh, all along the coast of the United States, here's another inlet. Uh, whenever it's going into high tide, water rushes in. When it's going to be low tide, water rushes out. And here the water speed's not super high. Like it isn't really high like it was in that example uh, with that very narrow inlet that was down in Australia. But still the water rushes in and out. So anyway, uh, that's the other thing you need to do. So on the right-hand side of your upcoming list, there's the waves and tsunami activity, which if you haven't finished that, uh, you want to finish that today and submit it. And then the next thing, the only other thing for this week that you have to uh, complete is the Tides Lab. When you click on the Tides Lab, I don't know exactly how it looks for you, but it'll open up the uh, SharePoint or the uh, OneDrive file and then the link for the site's right in there. Um, I record all these classes anyway, so if you have trouble with, um, let's see, yeah, if you have trouble with, uh, like if I went a little bit faster, have trouble with um, seeing how that goes or you were confused about something, you can watch the uh, Zoom recording. I always put the Zoom recording link right by the date in the plan for the week uh, for today's date. So that's a, that's a great idea or a great way to see how tides go. Maybe uh, you've been on vacation somewhere in the Carolinas or on the Jersey, Jersey uh, coast, or you've been to somewhere on the West coast and you want to look to see how the tides go. Most of the time, whenever you go to um, a tidal or a coastal community, like maybe you go to the Outer Banks or maybe you go to the Jersey Shore, you go to like Wildwood or something like that, New Jersey, or you go down to Ocean City, Maryland, a lot of times like along boardwalks and places like that, they'll have, uh, you know, shopkeepers and sometimes uh, even on like lifeguard stands, they'll post the high tide, low tide times. And uh, that can be useful if you're interested in surfing for recreation. But you'll also notice that sometimes if you go to the shore, like sometimes it just stinks. It smells bad. And that's usually when it's going into low tide. Because whenever you go into low tide and the water washes out, things that are living on uh, rocks like algae, uh, mussels, clams, crabs, fish, they get um, left high and dry. And then as the tide is low, um, all that sea life starts to smell real bad. So sometimes people will even like, you know, be on a highway, even close to the shore. Maybe you're even down near Philadelphia or New York City, and it just smells like the ocean or it smells fishy. It's likely low tide because the water's gone out and all that stuff that was living up on rocks is now uh, up uh, high and dry. And, you know, sometimes that life can survive being up in the air for quite a long time. And sometimes stuff just gets stranded and then it dies. Like a fish will be in a tidal pool. The water goes out. The fish is left high and dry and then it dies. And that's kind of disgusting and stinky. So we don't have tides in the Susquehanna River. So that's not an issue that you ever have to look at or worry about or think about or see. All right. That's all I got for you today. Um, if you have questions about anything, you can put them in the chat, uh, either publicly or privately, or you can turn on your mic and ask them. But if you don't have any questions, um, and you got some stuff to work on and you want to go, and that's totally cool. I'll catch you back here tomorrow. Make sure you log in every day, every period, and especially even on Thursday. Thursday is going to be a school day, like absolutely no matter what. So if you're good, I'll see you. If you have questions, just ask them.